Good morning and welcome to First Christian Church. We're so glad you're here with us this morning. A few announcements before we get started. Uh, we have our women's bingo night coming up on Friday and uh, our men have a gathering on Saturday morning uh, for breakfast. So both of those are awesome opportunities for fellowship. Highly encourage you to participate in those men's and women's fellowship opportunities. And last but not least, next week we have a single service and we are going to have that at 10 a.m. And uh, afterwards, we will have our forum, Creating a Community of Belonging, and that is for everyone to attend. We invite everyone to please come. You can bring friends. Uh, we will have childcare available for that, so uh, we just encourage you to please come. It'll be in the fellowship hall after worship. And now, let us worship God together. Most holy God, we kneel before you in awe and reverence. We are not worthy to untie the thong of your sandal. Come to us now in this time of worship. Open our ears to hear your call. Then give us the courage to rise and lace up our own shoes so that we may head out into the world to serve in your name. 
Please stand if you are able and join together in our opening hymn, How Firm a Foundation, number 618. time, I invite any children who are present with us this morning to please come forward. I have a story to share with you. Come sit by me. Good morning. Can you come sit on my other side so you can see the book? All right. This book is called Four Feet, Two Sandals. It's written by Karen Lynn Williams and Kadra Muhammad and illustrated by Doug Chaika. Lena raced barefoot to the camp entrance where relief workers threw used clothing off the back of a truck. Everyone pushed and fought for the best clothes. Lena squatted and reached, grabbing what she could. The crowd began to leave. In the dust at Lena's feet lay a brand new sandal. It was yellow with a blue flower in the middle, and when she slipped it on her foot, it fit perfectly. Lena was 10 but she had not worn shoes for two years. She looked around for the matching sandal. A girl stood nearby. She was thinner and darker than Lena, and she wore a blue and yellow sandal. as salam alaikum, Lena greeted her. Peace be with you. The girl only stared. She was dressed in a shalwar kameez. Her feet were cracked and swollen, as Lena's had been when she first arrived in camp. Suddenly, the girl turned, taking the matching sandal with her. In the morning, Lena went to do the washing, wearing one beautiful sandal. She picked her way to the stream, careful to keep her sandal out of the filth. Her old shoes had been ruined on the many miles of walking from Afghanistan to Peshawar, the refugee camp in Pakistan. She had carried her brother Najib, no bigger than a water jug then, but just as heavy. When she looked up from her scrubbing, the girl from yesterday was standing over her. She wore one sandal that she bent over and removed. Grandma said it's stupid to wear only one. She placed the sandal at Lena's feet. Then she turned and walked away. Wait, 
Lena grabbed both sandals and followed her. I am Lena. The girl turned slowly. I am Feroza. Lena held the sandals out. We can share. What good is one sandal for two feet, Feroza frowned. You wear them both today, and I will wear them tomorrow, Lena smiled. Four feet, two sandals. Feroza smiled too. She took the sandals and put them on. Tomorrow they will be yours. The two girls greeted each other as they carried their jugs of water the next day. Lena put the sandals on and they waited together in the long line. When they did not have work to do, Lena and Feroza crept up to the windows of the school and peeked inside. The school was small with only enough room for the boys to study. The girls practiced their names in the dirt and brushed the marks away so no one would see their mistakes. Sometimes each girl wore one sandal. Other children pointed and giggled, but Lena and Feroza did not care. In the evenings, the sky turned deep blue and the first stars began to sparkle. Lena and Feroza watched for the silver of the crescent moon that signaled the beginning of Ramadan. They shared memories and whispered their dreams for a new home. One morning, they went to the stream and washed their sandals to keep them looking new. Lena, come quick, Feroza's grandmother called. Your mother says your name is on the list. Feroza grabbed the sandals. The two girls ran ahead to the office. Lena stood on tiptoes and squinted at the sign. Mama's name, it's here. We are going to America. She looked at her friend. My name is not there, Feroza said quietly. She looked at her feet as she spoke. Then she bent down and took the sandals off. She handed them to Lena. You cannot go barefoot to America. Feroza gave Lena a hug. When it was time to leave, the relief worker gave Mama a large white square bag with numbers on it. All your papers are in this bag, he said. Feroza and her grandmother came to say goodbye. Lena looked at her feet. Look, Mama saved her sewing money. She has bought us shoes for America. Real shoes. Feroza admired the new black leather. Here, Lena said, it's your dare day to wear these. The tears in her eyes were not for the sandals. Assalam alaikum, Feroza said as she took the faded yellow and blue sandals. Peace be with you. Lena followed the others to the bus. Wait, Feroza called as she ran up to her friend. You must keep one. She handed Lena one sandal. What good is one sandal? It is good to remember. Feroza held up the other sandal. Four feet, two sandals. Lena felt the tears make a trail down her cheek. She slipped the sandal into her bag and climbed on the bus. Feroza ran alongside the bus as it began to move. Lena leaned out the window. We will share again in America, she called. What did you girls think of that book? You liked it? Me too. Why do you think they shared the sandals? What do you think? Was it to be nice to each other? Yeah. Yeah, you think so? Maybe to make friends? What do you think? Mm. Yeah? To make friends? Sharing is very nice. And in this book, it helped these two girls find a friendship, right? Mm. Right. All right, let's pray. Loving God, Thank you for sharing and love and friendship. Help us to share so that we can make new friends too. In your holy name we pray, amen. All right, thank you girls for joining me. As we come to our time of prayer now, I invite us into just a moment of silence to give us an opportunity to just set aside all the worries and distractions of our day and really just come into God's presence for a moment of peace. Let us pray. O oh God of all, our creator, our redeemer, and our friend, we come to you now in this time of worship, eager to meet you here. 
longing for moments of peace, longing for moments of connection with you and with one another, to be reminded that we were made for love and mercy. Come to us now, O oh God, in our time of worship. Forgive us for all the times in our week where we forget to acknowledge your presence. We seem to turn to you for requests for help, but forget to reach out with words of thanksgiving and worship. Accept our worship now, our devotion for all that you are and all that you have done in our lives and continue to do in our world. God, we know that as much as we weep for the suffering of those in our world, that we know that you grieve even more. We lift up our prayers to you for all whose hope is lost, who feel cut off, not only from those around them, but from you. God, we pray that by your grace, you will breathe new life into them, bring them back to the land of the living, to the community that will refresh. God, we pray also for all who are oppressed, for those who live under regimes of violence, for those who are held captive by their own fears. Release them, O oh God, from their chains, unbind them, and grant them freedom. We pray also for those who weep, for those who feel lost and lifeless, for those who suffer mourning or regret. God, grant them the peace of your presence. Show them what your love can do. We pray also for those who are dying, the light of life fading in their eyes. Oh God, help them to believe in you and to know that death does not get the last word, but in you there is life everlasting. God, we thank you for hearing our prayers not only for those across the world, but also for those near and dear to us that we love. We take a moment now to lift up those concerns in silence. Thank you, God, for hearing our petitions and our requests for doing even more than we could ask or imagine. Lord God, you are the great I am. You are the resurrection and the life. Grant us now new eyes to see through your scriptures, through our time of prayer and worship, who you are and who you have created us to be. We pray all of this in the prayer our Lord and Savior Jesus taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our first scripture this morning is from the book of Exodus, chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, 
I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. Then he said, come no closer, remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Our next scripture is from the book of Mark, chapter 6, 6 through 13. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Then he went out ab about among the villages teaching. He called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. He said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you as you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. May God bless the reading, the hearing, and the preaching of his holy word. So as we count down the weeks until Easter, every Sunday in Lent, we are choosing an object to look at uh, that relates to our scriptures and then also trying to make sense of what that means for our personal life and walk of faith. So our object today, as you've probably figured out, is shoes or sandals, as the case may be. As I was thinking about this object for my own personal life, I was thinking about how as a kid, that is the last thing I wanted to put on my feet were shoes. I loved going barefoot and went barefoot as much as I possibly could until my parents said, okay, we have to leave the house. You have to put on some shoes to go outside. Um, but, you know, there were occasions where I would agree to put on shoes, especially when I was 10 years old and they came out with jellies, which had sparkles and were pink and very fashionable, I thought. So then I was really happy to put on shoes if my parents would you know, just buy me, just buy me those pair of jellies. Um, then I would be happy to put on shoes. But for the most part, I just loved going barefoot. Now, as I've gotten older and perhaps more clumsy, I don't know what the reason is, but I have stubbed my toes and broken them on more than one occasion because I'm a slow learner. <laughs> and so now I wear shoes all the time. I wear shoes when I'm in my house, I have slippers on. <laughs> when I'm out of the house, I have shoes on so that I can protect my little toes <laughs> from my clumsiness. Now, some of you may be doing kind of a, a mental inventory of your closets as I speak. You know, all the shoes we have for different occasions, our workout shoes, our work shoes, our you know, gardening shoes, whatever it might be. For some of you, this inventory might take us a while if you're thinking about what's in your closet. I hear Connie laughing behind me. Um, <laughs> so for some of you, like, like my son, you've already finished your inventory, there's two. Sneakers and the pair of black shoes we had to buy for band. That's it, that's all we got. Um, so I want you to kind of hang on to that memory for just a minute, hold on to those little inventories. We're gonna get back to that uh, later on in the reflection today. But I wanna turn now to our scriptures for today. I wanna to talk first um, about the passage about Moses from Exodus. But you'll notice if we compare these two stories, of course they both include stories about sandals. In the first, in Exodus, Moses is asked to remove his sandals for he is on holy ground. But in the second story, the one of Jesus sending out the disciples, they are told to put on sandals. But Besides these differences between the two stories, one of the really important things to note is that both of these stories are incredibly similar because they are both call stories, meaning these are stories in which God has called people for a particular purpose, 
for a particular mission. In this case, it was to convey God's message to others and to accomplish these great works in God's name. So both of these call stories um, are very significant in the way that they understand the use of the, of the shoe or the sandal. But let's take a look at Moses first. So Moses is out tending his flocks, and he notices there's, there's this bush that's engulfed in flames and yet is not burned up. So he goes to investigate. And as he gets closer, a voice speaks to him from the bush and says, come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for this is holy ground. Now, if we continued reading the passage, we would learn that God goes on to explain to Moses that God has heard the cries of his people, Israel, who are in bondage in Egypt under Pharaoh, and that God has a plan to deliver his people out of slavery and bondage and to bring them into a land flowing with milk and honey. And he has chosen Moses to accomplish this task. Now, Moses, of course, is a little reluctant about this assignment, about this daunting task, and so he questions God about it. Who am I, he says, that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God says this in reply. He says, I will be with you, and this shall be a sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship on this very mountain where you are standing right now, and that will be your sign. So Moses agrees and follows God's command. Now I want to turn our attention to our gospel story, the story from the gospel of Mark. As we know, Jesus has been traveling the countryside with these 12 disciples, and they've witnessed him preach and teach to the crowds. They've seen him heal, restore people to wholeness. And now Jesus tells them it's their turn. <laughs> now they are going to have to go out and teach and heal and do all of that in God's name, that they will be Christ's messengers. And he gives them some important instructions and he tells them to take nothing with them on their journey, but just a staff in their hand and sandals on their feet. So no money, no bag, not even two tunics, just a staff in their hand and sandals on their feet. And here, I think we can gather what is really significant for Jesus is that his followers learn what it means to put their whole trust in God, to depend on God completely for their needs. So how does all of this relate to us? Obviously, burning bushes and those kinds of encounters aren't exactly commonplace. I'm not sure Jesus is really asking us to give up our cars and put on sandals and go door to door proselytizing. But I don't think we have to interpret these passages quite so literally to see that the underlying message is still incredibly relevant. Because to be a follower of Jesus is to be out in the world, it's to be on the move. God sends us out, out from our comfortable circles of family and friends, out into the community to encounter the people that God has sent us to who need a message of hope and encouragement, who need to know that they aren't alone, that God is with them, and that God de desires their wholeness, their deliverance, because shoes were made for walking, for getting out. Now, the other thing we learn from these stories is, yes, there is going to be a bit of risk, and it's going to take quite a bit of trust to be this follower, a disciple of Jesus. We really are going to have to rely on God's provision, and we may even need to prepare for a little resistance 
or even rejection. Jesus tells his disciples, if anyone doesn't welcome you or listen to you, just shake the dust from your sandals and keep on going. So whether we are called to take on the pharaohs of this world, the powers that dehumanize, or whether we are called to show compassion to the stranger next door, whatever it is, it's the Holy Spirit alone who has the power to really transform hearts and minds. Our job is simply to remain faithful to keep working for wholeness in our fragmented world. Now our scriptures remind us that this journey, of course, is gonna be challenging and doubts will probably arise. Those Israelites wandered in the desert for 40 years before reaching the promised land and many times along the way, they doubted that they would ever get there and they even thought about turning back. And I imagine that Moses had to hold fast to that holy ground memory, that moment to recall the burning bush, God's voice promising that one day they would return and worship together on that mountain. It's a good reminder, I think, to us that we too, we need those holy ground moments. We need moments where we can just be in God's presence through worship and prayer, through study of scripture and just moments of silence, moments to reflect on God's promises and to rekindle a sense of hope. Now I wanna bring us back to that image of shoes, our little inventory at the beginning about having different shoes for different purposes. And it was reminded me of a dear friend from my childhood. And that friend is Mr. Rogers. <laughs> that is my generation. I grew up watching Mr. Rogers as a kid. And you may remember, those of you who saw the show, that every episode, the first thing he did was walk through the door he would take off his work coat and put on his cardigan. Then he would take off his work shoes, put on his house shoes, all the while singing this little welcoming song to, to me, really was, it, was, it was to me, but to all of his friends out in TV land. And as you probably know, Mr. Rogers is a Presbyterian, was a Presbyterian minister. And so he was very intentional about all the choices he made with his show. And I think that moment is really a significant moment. I mean, yes, it's kind of a daily routine and we know that children thrive on routine and structure, so there was that. But I also think it was symbolic that he, when he crossed that threshold, that he put on his new pair of shoes and he kind of invited us into his world. It was like he was inviting us into his home, into his living room, and he was setting aside that time to spend just with me, I mean with us, but he really had that moment of like intentionality, you know, and I think honestly that's a great teaching moment for all of us about the importance of purpose and intention in all that we do in our day. So here's the takeaway. As you go about your week this week, I'm going to encourage you every time you put on a pair of shoes to just take a moment to pause and stop and offer up a short prayer. Maybe it's as simple as, God, I am your servant. Use me as you see fit. Or maybe it's more specific. Maybe as you lace up your workout sneakers, you say, a prayer of thanks, thank you God, for the ability to walk or run or, or swim. You know, help me stay focused on taking care of my health. Let that be my motivation, not so much vanity or, or ego. If you have a workout buddy, maybe say a prayer of thanksgiving for that. And maybe as you get ready to head out to work and you put on your work shoes, offer up a prayer to God that God would grant you diligence, honesty, integrity, 
as you go about your work. You know, asking God to help us be not only respectful, but generous with our coworkers or clients or the public or whoever it is that we're interacting with. And then as we go about town, running those lovely errands that we love to run, taking our kids to all the activities that they have, maybe take a moment to just pay attention to the people and the places around us. God, help me see beyond my circle to those today who might be struggling, who might be suffering, who might be sitting alone in the bleachers while all the other parents are talking over here. Just give me compassion and wisdom in my day. And then finally, as we go home at the end of a day, like Mr. Rogers, you know, as we head into that house, you know, take off that, those work shoes and, and put on those house shoes, that's an opportunity right there to just be present with our families, with our loved ones, to really leave work behind, you know, and be fully engaged with the people in front of us so that we can fully listen to them and fully love them for who they are. And honestly, that's not a bad thing to do every time we change shoes or change tasks. Help me, God, to just be fully present in this moment. But regardless of whatever task is at hand, our shoes, of course, have one purpose, which is for walking, <laughs> because we are always being sent out. As the scriptures remind us, we have been chosen as Christ's ambassadors. How will the world know God's mercy and compassion and deliverance if it were not for those willing to share and work for those things? But if it feels daunting at times, just remember that we do not walk alone, that God walks with us, and that God will never leave us or forsake us. Let us pray. God, we are your servants. Use us as you see fit. Like Moses, we don't necessarily feel equipped, but we trust you to give us the words that need to be said and the power to do what needs to be done. Help us not to take it personally when others reject what we are trying to say or do and give us the courage to follow in the steps of our Redeemer, Jesus Christ, and to just keep walking. Amen.
From James 1, verse 17, it tells us, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. First and foremost, God wants us to give because it shows that we recognize he is truly the Lord of our lives. Everything we own, everything we have, com we have comes from God. So when we give, we simply offer him a very small portion of all the abundance he has already given to us. Giving of our time and talents and our financial giving is an expression of our thankfulness and praise to God. Let us give freely with a generous and joyful spirit today and every day in remembrance of our many blessings for everything we give already belongs to God. Will the deacons please come forward to receive our gifts and offerings? Loving God, we thank you for your grace, for this community of faith, for the gifts of our lives. Bless these gifts and offerings today that they might be used to further your work here on earth. Work through each of us and through the ministries of this congregation that we might glorify you in all we do. Amen. Please be seated. As we prepare to come to this table together for communion, we invite all of you watching at home to go ahead and gather whatever communion supplies you have on hand. If you're worshiping in person today, in just a few moments, we will invite you to come forward to receive the bread. Our elder Connie will have a gluten-free option as well as a self-serve option. And then head to the side aisles to receive the cup and then back to your seats. If you prefer to remain seated, simply put your hand up and one of our deacons will come around and serve you in your seats. As we approach this table of grace, we know that we are on holy ground for the living God promises to be present in this bread and in this cup. And so as we walk forward today, let us walk forward in reverence and in awe 
Let us approach with humility, but also with hope. For God will provide everything that we need for the journey. The table is ready. Come. On the night before he met with death, Jesus gathered with his closest friends, his disciples, and he took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to them and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup and said, This is the cup of the new covenant, sealed in my blood and poured out for the forgiveness of all sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. And so whenever we join together in this bread, in this cup, we proclaim Christ's saving life, death, and resurrection until he comes again. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Please join me in prayer. Loving God, who receives us as we are, we accept your invitation to surround your table bringing many things. We bring to your table uncertainties, despair, conflict in relationships, conflict of our will and your will, pain of loss, fears and failures, hope and joy of new beginnings. And yet we are amazed that you want us with whatever baggage we carry, but we are here. As we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, remind us that Jesus experienced all the feelings that we do, including despair and the joy of resolve through the resurrection. May this bread and this cup remind us that Jesus carried a heavy load to the cross, and now you carry for us whatever we are willing to leave here. By your spirit, may we realize that you are always with us in the depths as well as the height in the darkness as well as the brightness of day. All this we ask in your name. Amen.
as Pastor Sarah said in her sermon, we are called by Christ to go out into the world and spread his word. We are called to do so with nothing but the staff in our hand and the sandals on our feet, but we are not called to do so alone. We are accompanied by God and by one another. That is what it means to be a community of faith. And so if you are looking for a church home, uh, or if you are wishing to reaffirm your faith, I invite you during this next hymn to come forward and be welcomed into our community or to reaffirm your faith. Or if you are in need of prayer or support, I encourage you to come see myself or Pastor Sarah after church or during the week. We would love to meet with you. And now, as we go from here, go forth into the world, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Go and join Christ in the world, healing and speaking words of freedom, revealing the sacred in the very midst of life, through the ever-flowing grace of God, our creator, redeemer, and sustainer.
And all God's people said, 